staying power. Never give up. There are chances and changes helping the hopeful a hundred to one. And through the chaos, high wisdom arranges ever success if you'll only hold on. Never give up. For the wisest is boldest, knowing that providence mingles the cup. And of all maxims, the best as the oldest is the stern watchword of never give up. Be firm. One constant element of luck is genuine, solid, old Teutonic pluck. Holmes. Success in most things depends on knowing how long it takes to succeed. Montesquieu. The power to hold on is characteristic of all men who have accomplished anything great. They may lack in some other particular, have many weaknesses or eccentricities, but the quality of persistence is never absent from a successful man. No matter what opposition he meets or what discouragement overtakes him, drudgery cannot disgust him, obstacles cannot discourage him, labour cannot weary him, misfortune, sorrow and reverses cannot harm him. It is not so much brilliancy of intellect or fertility of resource as persistency of effort, constancy of purpose that makes a great man. Those who succeed in life are the men and women who keep everlastingly at it, who do not believe themselves geniuses but who know that if they ever accomplish anything, they must do it by determined and persistent industry. I trample on impossibilities. So it was said by Lord Chatham. Why, asked Mirabeau, quote, should we call ourselves men unless it be to succeed in everything everywhere? End quote. It is all very well, said Charles J. Fox, quote, to tell me that a young man has distinguished himself by a brilliant first speech. He may go on satisfied with his first triumph. But show me a young man who has not succeeded at first and has then gone on, and I will back that man to do better than those who succeeded at the first trial. End quote. Cobden broke down completely the first time he appeared on a platform in Manchester, and the chairman apologised for him. But he did not give up speaking until every poor man in England had a larger, better and cheaper loaf. Young Disraeli sprung from a hated and persecuted race, pushed his way up through the middle classes and upper classes until he stood self-poised upon the topmost round of political and social power. At first he was scoffed at, ridiculed, rebuffed, hissed from the House of Commons, he simply said, quote, The time will come when you will hear me. End quote. The time did come, and he swayed the sceptre of England for a quarter of a century. How massive was the incalculable reserve power of Lincoln as a youth, or of President Garfield, woodchopper, bell ringer, and sweeper general in college? persistent purpose. We hear a great deal of talk about genius, talent, luck, chance, cleverness and fine manners playing a large part in one's success. Leaving out luck and chance, all these elements are important factors. Yet the possession of any or all of them, unaccompanied by a definite aim, a determined purpose will not ensure success. Men drift into business, they drift into society, they drift into politics, they drift into what they fondly and but vainly imagine is religion. If winds and tides are favourable, all is well. If not, all is wrong. Stalker says, quote, Most men merely drift through life and the work they do is determined by a hundred different circumstances. They might as well be doing anything else, or they would prefer to be doing nothing at all. End quote. 
Yet, whatever else may have been lacking in the giants of the race, the men who have been conspicuously successful have all had one characteristic in common, doggedness and persistence of purpose. It does not matter how clever a youth may be, whether he leads his class in college or outshines all the other boys in his community, he will never succeed if he lacks this essential of determined persistence. Many men who might have made brilliant musicians, artists, teachers, lawyers, able physicians or surgeons, in spite of predictions to the contrary, have fallen short of success because deficient in this quality. Persistence of purpose is a power. It creates confidence in others. Everybody believes in the determined man. When he undertakes anything, his battle is half won, because not only he himself, but everyone who knows him, believes that he will accomplish whatever he sets out to do. People know that it is useless to oppose a man who uses his stumbling blocks as stepping stones, who is not afraid of defeat, who never, in spite of calumny or criticism, shrinks from his task who never shirks responsibility, who always keeps his compass pointed to the north star of his purpose, no matter what storms may rage about him. The persistent man never stops to consider whether he is succeeding or not. The only question with him is how to push ahead, to get a little farther along, a little nearer his goal. Whether it lead over mountains, rivers or morasses, he must reach it. Every other consideration is sacrificed to this one dominant purpose. The success of a dull or average youth and the failure of a brilliant one is a constant surprise in American history. But if the different cases are closely analysed, we shall find that the explanation lies in the staying power of the seemingly dull boy. The ability to stand firm as a rock under all circumstances to allow nothing to divert him from his purpose. Three necessary things. Three things are necessary, said Charles Sumner. Quote, First, backbone. Second, backbone. Third, backbone. End quote. A good chance alone is nothing. Education is nothing without strong and vigorous resolution and stamina to make one accomplish something in the world. An encouraging start is nothing without backbone. A man who cannot stand erect, who wobbles first one way and then the other, who has no opinion of his own or courage to think his own thought, is of very little use in this world. It is grit. It is perseverance, it is moral stamina and courage that govern the world. At the trial of the seven bishops of the Church of England for refusing to aid the king to overthrow the Protestant faith, it was necessary to watch the officers at the doors, lest they send food to some juryman and aid him to starve the others into an agreement. Nothing was allowed to be sent in but water for the jurymen to wash in, and they were so thirsty they drank it up. At first, nine were for acquitting and three for convicting. Two of the minority soon gave way. The third, Arnold, was obstinate. He declined to argue. Austin said to him, Look at me. I am the largest and the strongest of the twelve, and before I will find such a petition as this libel, here will I stay. Till I am no bigger than a tobacco pipe. Arnold yielded at six in the morning. Success against odds. Yes, to this thought I hold with firm persistence. The last result of wisdom stamps it true. He only earns his freedom and existence who daily conquers them anew. Goethe. It is interesting to notice how some minds seem almost to create themselves, says Irving, quote, springing up under every disadvantage and working their solitary but irresistible way through a thousand obstacles. 
end quote. Opposing circumstances create strength. Opposition gives us greater power of resistance. To overcome one barrier gives us greater ability to overcome the next. History is full of examples of men and women who have redeemed themselves from disgrace, poverty and misfortune by the firm resolution of an iron will. Success is not measured by what a man accomplishes, but by the opposition he has encountered and the courage with which he has maintained the struggle against overwhelming odds. Not the distance we have run, but the obstacles we have overcome, the disadvantages under which we have made the race, will decide the prizes. It is defeat, says Henry Ward Beecher, quote, that turns bone to flint and gristle to muscle and makes men invincible, and formed those heroic natures that are now in ascendancy in the world. Do not then be afraid of defeat. You are never so near to victory as when defeated in a good cause. End quote. Governor Seymour of New York, a man of great force and character, said in reviewing his life, quote, If I were to wipe out twenty acts, what should they be? Should it be my business mistakes, my foolish acts, for I suppose all do foolish acts occasionally, my grievances? No, for after all, these are the very things by which I have profited. So I finally concluded I should expunge, instead of my mistakes, my triumphs. I could not afford to dismiss the tonic of mortification, the refinement of sorrow. I needed them, every one. End quote. Every condition, be it what it may, says Channing, quote, has hardships, hazards, pains. We try to escape them. We pine for a sheltered lot, for a smooth path, for cheering friends and unbroken success. But providence ordains storms, disasters, hostilities, sufferings. And the great question whether we shall live to any purpose or not, whether we shall grow strong in mind and heart or be weak and pitiable, depends on nothing so much as on our use of the adverse circumstances. Outward evils are designed to school our passions and to rouse our faculties and virtues into intenser action. Sometimes they seem to create new powers. Difficulty is the element and resistance the true work of man. Self-culture never goes on so fast as when embarrassed circumstances, the opposition of men or the elements, unexpected changes of the times or other forms of suffering, instead of disheartening, throw us on our inward resources, turn us for strength to God, clear up to us the great purpose of life and inspire calm resolution. No greatness or goodness is worth much unless tried in these fires. End quote. Better to stem with heart and hand the roaring tide of life than lie unmindful on its flowery strand of God's occasions drifting by. Better with naked nerve to bear the needles of this goading air than in the lap of sensual ease forego the godlike power to do, the godlike aim to know. <laughs>